Good morning. Still a good morning. Even better yet. Okay, you guys have moved around. <laughs> Laura, Matthew, Richard. <laughs> now I don't know where. What are you guys doing up so close? <laughs> you guys are just. I don't know where to look now. now. Actually, I need to clarify something for you. I have been told several times over the past two weeks that I tend to glare when I'm preaching. As a matter of fact, I've, I've been told by my wife, she is so glad that I'm not looking at her when I do that. Uh, and I, I want to share with you, I'm not looking at any of you. Okay, I actually don't look at faces when I preach, because if I look at faces, I, I get discombobulated and flustered. And, and so when I'm, I'm pausing and I'm looking, I'm not looking at you. If I'm looking in your direction, just assume I'm looking at the person next to you. Okay, because I'm not really looking at either of you. Okay? Um, we have a, a couple of things that need to be addressed today because we're working through uh, the fruit of the Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start there so everybody's kind of on the same page. We're in Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to pick up in verse 16, and then I'm going to skip ahead because I'm, we're not dealing with the works of the flesh, so we're just going to skip that passage. I'm going to start in 16, and then you're going to see me jump, and I'm going to jump all the way down to verse 22. So starting in 16, it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing what you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now we're going to jump down to verse 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and being one another. And we started off this, this series by talking about walking in the Spirit and how that's something God is, is teaching Christy and I to do, to, to walk according to His Spirit. And, and we're, we're taking baby steps. Sometimes I feel more like I'm crawling in the spirit because I spend an awful lot of time on my face. And one of the things that we're working through is um, the fruit of the spirit that is listed here, we need to understand this is not my fruit. It's not your fruit. It's not something we can just wake up in the morning and say, you know what, today I'm going to exhibit patience. I guarantee you if you say that, you're going to have the worst day ever. <laughs> okay? Because God's going to give you opportunities to exhibit patience. These are the fruits of His Spirit living in you. Okay? This is the natural outgrowth of being saved. When we come to the cross, He gives us His Spirit, seals us unto salvation. The mark that we know that we are His. Okay? And if this Spirit is living in you, then this is what should be coming out of you. Now, keep in mind... Like 1 Peter tells us, we're not doing this perfectly. We're doing it increasingly, in increasing measure. Okay? Also keep in mind that you're not to compare yourself to me, lest you get a big head. Nor are you compare yourself to Paul or, or whoever your favorite preacher is, lest you would be humiliated. We don't compare ourselves to each other. We compare ourselves to Christ. Okay? That's the measure. Because it's really easy for me to look around and find flaws in people and go, huh, at least I don't have that. And feel good about myself. And that way lays pride. 
Because there, it's like I've accomplished something. And, and I, I can't accomplish anything apart from the power of Jesus Christ living in me. Okay? So we don't look at each other. We don't go, well, I may not be really good at peace, but compared to that guy, I've got a whole lot of self-control. No, okay, we're already off track. Okay? Because we, we measure ourselves against Jesus Christ. That's the calling to which we go. All right? So, first, we're walking by the Spirit. It's a Spirit living in us. That's the fruit that should come out from us. Second, quit looking at where other people are, whether they're ahead of you or whether they're behind you. You need to be looking toward the goal that we're pressing towards, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay? So, the first week we covered love. Uh, last week we talked about joy, but we're, I'm not done with joy. We're going to talk a little bit more about joy. You're going to get like a sermonette today. That's not a female sermon. It's a short sermon. Okay, it's not like Mrs. Sermon and Mr. Sermon. It's just a short sermon. So I, I need to go back because there were some things that I had written down for my message last week that we didn't get to. And I, I felt when, when we were done, I felt like, okay, we need to stop. We're, we've said what needs to be said today. Over the course of the week, I feel like God has kind of been bringing me back to some of those things about joy. All right? So we're going to touch on joy, and hopefully we'll actually get to peace. Because peace is something that I feel like God has really been working to teach me. And he, he does that by giving me a lot of things that are not peaceful. He gives me a lot of turmoil. Okay? And I was so excited last night when I went to bed. I looked over the notes and, and felt like God had really given me clear direction on where I was going. And I tell you what, last night stunk. I had horrible dreams. I, I woke up this morning and, and I, I determined I need to get up at a certain time because I need to go pray. I knew the night was a struggle. I need to get up and pray. And I, I looked at the clock. I got, okay, 15 minutes. I'm getting up. I'm going to go pray. Guess what happened? I rolled over and looked at the clock again. And I said, oh, good. I've got 20 minutes till I have to get up. And I rolled back over and I thought, wait a minute. I had 15 minutes a minute ago. And now I've got 20 minutes. That's not right. <laughs> I rolled back over and looked at the clock again, and I'd overslept. And I was, I was frustrated. I was mad. I tell you, by the time I got to the bathroom, the enemy was digging me. And, and oh, yeah, you overslept. What kind of Christian are you? You shouldn't even be pastor. <laughs> You're right. I shouldn't. <laughs> oh. And then, of course, Christy happened to walk into the bathroom as I'm going, Ugh! And so, of course, I had to let her join the fun, and I went, Ugh! And she went, what did I do? <laughs> You, you happen to be the closest person. And so both of us went, and, and I, I, I knew I, I got to get out and pray. I got to get out and pray. And quite honestly, what I should have done is put on a pair of sweatpants, put on a shirt and a jacket, and gone outside and prayed. But no, I got to brush my teeth. I got to wash my face. I got to make sure everything's ready so I'm presentable to God. Like he cares. Okay? He doesn't care how I look. And, and so I waited and I waited, and, and quite honestly, the longer I waited, as I tried to accomplish my morning routine, the worse I got. And Christy will testify to that fact, because she couldn't breathe without me snapping at her. You have to use up so much oxygen. Leave some for the rest of us. I'm oxygen deprived this morning. I didn't, I didn't say that. I wish it had been that easy. So I, I went out and I started praying, and, and mostly my prayer was, God, please help me. Please help me. I'm, I'm feeling not peaceful today. And I, told, I, I felt like you told me, go get your message and look at your message. So I went and I got the notes that I had typed up for this morning, and, and I looked at them, and I, I, I didn't want to read them. Because how can I tell you something that I'm so obviously failing at? Well, I put them away. God said, no, you need to read them. I pulled them out. I looked at him and I put him away and he said, you really need to read the notes because they're not your notes, they're the words that I gave you. <clears throat> okay, God. And as I started reading over them, and really uh, the notes were not my thinkings, they were, they were just scriptures that I had written down based on what God tells us in his word about peace. And all of a sudden I started realizing that I don't need to get peace. I have peace. He's already given it to me. I need to start living it. I need to just get out of his way and let him let that peace settle on me. And I'll tell you what, within 
five minutes, maybe, God completely turned my morning around. And I was just, I was humbled because I don't have the ability to accomplish these things that he's asking me to do. Uh, you don't have the ability to accomplish these things that he's asking you to do. That's why he's God and we're not. Okay, because he has the ability. Not only does he have the ability, he has the desire. He longs to do these things. So let's back up. We're going to look for just a couple minutes at joy. And we talked last week um, about in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. We talked about getting into the presence of the Lord. One of the things that we didn't talk on, um, see, the, the thing about all of these fruits is they have their counterfeit in the world around us. Okay, we talked last week about happiness and how joy is not equal to happiness. You can't compare them side to side and come up favorably because you know happiness is based on an event or something going on. Joy is based on who you know, who lives inside of you. Okay, and and we talked about um, this idea that in order to have joy, you just got to be Miss Perky. <laughs> Everything is happy. Don't worry, be happy now. That's not it. That's not it at all. Quite honestly, Jesus is who we are pursuing, right? Jesus is who we are to be like. How much joy did he show clearing out the temple? <coughs> you didn't go there. I went there. You see, it's not a matter of, of what God has called us to do. It's a matter of who lives in us. Now, I want, to, I want to share a couple things with you because joy exists regardless of what is going on around us. And we have to know that. We have to be aware of that. Because every one of us is going to go through hardship. Every one of us has a story. Okay? Every one of us is continuing to build our story day by day by day. Minute by minute sometimes. So, we need to take a look at a couple things about joy. First thing, if Jesus is our model, Hebrews chapter 12. Go ahead and flip over there real quick. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, this comes right after chapter 11, because that's the way it works and the way we number things. And, but chapter 11, can anybody tell me what chapter 11 is? Yeah, it's the Hall of Faith. These are all the great men and women of God that exhibited faith. And, and so, as the writer of Hebrews is, is wrapping up that, that incredible passage on, on faith, he starts in, in chapter 12 and he says, Therefore, and the therefore is there because he's talking about all of these great men and women of God, the men and women of faith. He says, Therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all of these people of faith are, are aware of us, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. <coughs> Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay? So, there's a couple things that I want to point out in this passage. Okay? First, is that Jesus is the author of our faith. Alright? Our faith comes from Him. Now, we have been given faith. Jesus even says faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, remember? Remember? I, I've never seen mustard seed. The only mustard I've seen is liquid form. And, and you can't grow that. You can get stuff to grow in it, but you can't actually grow the mustard. I've tried. It doesn't work. But if he has given us faith, it's up to us to use it. Right? Right? I mean, if I'm to give you a car and you walk to Missoula, 
That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Well, you've got a vehicle. Why didn't you take the vehicle? Well, because I thought walking would be better. Well, it might be better for your health, pending you don't get hit by another car. <laughs> but you, you, you're, you're not using what was given to you. Well, if God's given us faith, we have to use it. Right? So if faith is given to us from Jesus, we've got to implement that faith. Right? So then we go on, and he says, For the joy... Oh, oh let, me, let me back up. Not only is he the one that gives us the faith, but he says, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Do, do you see that? Do, do, you, do you know what that means? It's like uh, being given a lump of wood. And from that lump of wood, you're going to make something beautiful. You're going to create something incredible. What has to happen to that lump of wood for that to happen? <clears throat> it has to be shaped. It has to be roughed up and smoothed out and buffed and sanded and, and cut and trimmed and I don't even know all the, the, the words that, that Mike would, would use to, you know, I just go, I, I don't know, I look here, I'm giving you this, you give me that. And that's kind of our mentality with faith, isn't it? We go, okay God, you give me faith, but I want it to be all cleaned up and pretty and neat so I can use it and not have to work on it. But Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that takes us through things that our faith would be proven of greater worth than gold. And you know what those things are? Trials. Trials. That's what Peter tells us. Trials. Hardship. Difficulties. God allows these to come on us that our faith may be proven of greater worth than gold. Not to him. He already knows. But to us. And as we come out the other side, we see the value of what he's given us by what we've gone through. You know? By the buffing, by the sanding, by the ick that we have to deal with. Now let's, let's look a little bit further here what he says. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Now, have you ever considered what the joy was that was set before him? <laughs> yeah. The joy set before him is us. You know, people go, oh, it, it's, you know, going to be seated at the right hand of God. He is God. He was God before. He's God now. He was God during. So it's not, to, he was already there. It's not because every knee is going to bow. That was already going to happen. It's us. That's the joy set before him. To conquer sin and death. That we might be delivered unto eternal life. Unto eternal life with him. That's the joy set before him. You can kind of look at it this way. And, and women will get this. Men, I know we won't. Having a baby is not an easy thing. Delivering a baby is very, very difficult. Okay? I was there five times. I did not want to be there any times. I don't do... I don't like seeing people that I love hurt. And I don't like icky, yucky, squirty things. <laughs> Okay? So when we came into the delivery room, I told him to take the mirror out, put my chair facing my wife's head, and, and I will stay out of your way. I don't want to see it until it has been cleaned and it looks like a human baby, put a little hat on it. Okay? That's, that's me. But my wife chose to go through that because of her love for the children. Okay? Because of her love for her children. Now, the, the nearest I've ever come to delivery is kidney stones. And I will tell you right now, they are not worth it. 
<laughs> They're not. When you're done, you got a rock. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Nobody cares. No one cares. But man, when you got a baby, boy, every man, have you ever seen a big, gruff man hold a baby? You know, they just turn soft and gushy. You know, and there's something about a baby that just, just makes people warm up and melt. Women choose to endure that because of the joy they know that's on the other side. Well, Jesus chose to endure the cross. And, and think about this. It's not just a death. He didn't just choose to die. He chose to be beaten, to be scourged, to be despised, to have the beard ripped out of his face, all of these horrible physical things. But beyond that, he chose to be utterly rejected by those he came to save. To be utterly rejected. He chose to be utterly abandoned, not only by all those who professed to love him around him, but even unto God himself. He said, why, God, why have you forsaken me? He chose to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's the joy that he was looking to that made the cross worth it. Okay? Now, if Jesus is our model, if Jesus is our model, I would challenge us, and I, I'm challenging myself with this as well, when you're in the midst of hardship, when you're in the midst of turmoil, when you're in the midst of pain, whether it be physical, whether it be emotional, whether it be mental, whatever, when you're in pain, look to the joy set before you. Okay? Look to the joy that is set before you. Understand when Paul says, these are temporary. They're light and momentary. Okay? They're light and momentary. Nobody thinks they're momentary when you're going through it. Nobody thinks they're light when you're going through it. But we have a joy on the other side that is waiting for us. Imagine being in the very presence of God and having him say, well done. Good job. With you, I am pleased. Can you imagine that? The almighty creator of the universe that holds everything together by his word? Being pleased with you? Not just being pleased with somebody, but being pleased with you? Can you imagine him telling the devil, have you considered my servant? Yeah, go ahead, put them under trial. Let's see how they do. I got faith in them. I'm going to give them everything they need to overcome. Can you imagine that? And then you come out the other side, and he looks at Satan and says, See? See? So for the joy set before him. Another passage that I want you to look at. Don't, don't flip there. You can look at this a little bit later. James chapter 1. James is writing, and he tells us, Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When I was young, um, I have a, a brother that's just a little bit older than I am. He was a weightlifter. And he had a weight bench set up down in the, the basement in the family room, and he would go out and he'd lift weights, and occasionally he'd ask me to come spot him. And boy, was it tempting to, oops. <laughs> uh, you know, he's trying to max out on his bench, and it'd be really tempting to just go, uh -huh. But I hope, oh, I hope that's not him. <laughs> I was not a weightlifter, but I was a runner. 
And I would, when I played soccer, I ran, you know, five miles a day was not a big deal for me. And I, and I ran, but you know, when I started running, I couldn't run five miles a day. I, I, I have something I had to work up to. There's something I had to make myself do to be good at. When he started lifting weights, he, he couldn't bench, you know, 240, 250 when he first started lifting weights. He had to work up to it. And the working up is a painful, difficult process. How badly do you want to be in shape spiritually? How badly do you want to be mature and complete, not lacking anything? Because see, the test is this. When the trial comes upon you, we pray, God, grow me in you. Make me more like Jesus. And God says, okay. And we go, God, not that! Take this away from me, deliver me. I rebuke you, devil! And God's going, wait, 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 wait. Hey, 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 hey. This is how you become mature and complete. You gotta deal with these things. You got to throw yourself on me when you're dealing with these things. Because keep in mind, he's not giving you a test or a trial for you to deal with on your own. That, that's, that's not the end result. The end result is that you would always throw yourself on him. And then he steps in and takes care of the test and the trial for you. Now, sometimes he does that by eliminating the trial altogether. Case in point. The weird thing that I had going on with my heart. He just... He, Took care of that. Done. Gone. Sometimes he leaves it in place and gives you what you need to deal with it. Case in point, my diabetes. He gives me what I need to deal with it. Okay? But always, always, always he is there. And he longs and desires for us to throw ourselves on him. How else can you consider it joy? Let's take a look at something. I've I got a passage in Acts that I struggle with because I understand it intellectually, but I don't understand it emotionally. We're going to flip over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, um, the, the passage starts in verse 17. I'm not going to read the entire passage. I just want to share with you what's going on. And then there's a particular part I want to read to you. So the apostles, Jesus has ascended into heaven. They've had the outpouring of God's spirit in the upper room. The apostles, uh, Peter and John, have been arrested. They've been taken before the Sanhedrin. They've been questioned. Uh, they were miraculously delivered. The, the Sanhedrin comes in the next morning and says, okay, bring the prisoners up. We want to question them some more. And they go, um, they're not there. What do you mean they're not there? Well, they were there, but they're not there. Because now they're, they're actually, they're, they're in the temple preaching. And they're there. Oh, well, um, okay, go get them. So, so the guards go out to get them, and, it, and it's kind of funny because the guards go out to get them, but uh, they don't arrest them because they're afraid of the people. They're afraid the, the, the guards are afraid they're going to get stoned because of the miraculous things that God is doing with these apostles. The, the guards had a little bit more together than the Sanhedrin did at this point. So they bring them in, and they are questioning them, and they're, they're saying, it, didn't we tell you guys to quit doing this? And, and Peter, I love Peter. Peter had a lot of flaws, but Peter was never lacking in boldness. Peter goes, we got to do what God says. 
Now, he didn't do that because that would have been dishonoring to the high priest, but that's kind of the, the attitude that Peter has. Is, well, let's see. I can choose to do what you say, or I can choose to do what God says. Hmm, no, sorry, going to do what God says. There, there's no question. And they, they get angry, and so they're going back and forth. What should we do? What should we do? What should we do? I know, let's kill them. Let's just eliminate the problem. That works so well with Jesus. Okay, back. <coughs> well, let's just get rid of him. Then one of the men stands up, a priest by the name of Gamaliel. You, you run into him later, actually you run into mention of him, because this was the um, rabbi that Paul studied under. Okay? And actually, if you look in, in the rabbinic histories, he's actually very highly honored in, in the rabbinic histories. Okay? And he stands up and he, he makes some comments. He says, speaking very wisely, he says, uh, men of Israel, take care of what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed. And all who were following were dispersed, and they came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished. And all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan, or if this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and I'm down in verse 40 right now. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, that's kind of puzzling to me, but this is not the thing that I have the most difficulty with. They, they understand, they're in agreement with Gamaliel. <coughs> Don't kill him because if the man, if this is of God, you're opposing God. You're right. Let's beat him instead. <laughs> that just, that makes no sense to me. But okay. They beat him. Now this is where things really get confusing to me. Not, not really confusing. I just struggle with them. <laughs> then they, this is the apostles, left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Rejoicing. <coughs> Remember, rejoicing is to have exceeding or abundant joy. So, they are taking joy in the abuse that was heaped on them by the Sanhedrin, by the leaders. They're taking joy. See, we, we've got to get out of this idea that when bad things happen to us, we're outside of God's will or that we've done something wrong. Because there are a lot of times when bad things happen to us, it's because we're exactly in God's will. We need to get this, this materialistic attitude, this, this very American idea that, that good things happen when you're in God's will and bad things happen when you're outside of God's will. Now, don't get me wrong. When you are outside of God's will, bad things will happen. Why? Because he's trying to get you back into his will. <clears throat> when you're in his will, he wants to grow you. He wants to refine you. He wants to test you so that you can see the value of what he has done in you. <clears throat> Greater value than gold. I, I, don't, I don't know a whole lot about gold but I know it's worth more than I've got. People do a lot of weird things for gold. Okay? And God paves his streets with it. Matter of fact, in the reign of Solomon, gold was so plentiful that silver was cast aside as being worthless. If God puts that value on gold and man has received that value from God as being gold, 
And he says, your faith is more valuable than this. Shouldn't we rethink our attitude? See, I'm not, I'm not asking you to be giddily happy when bad things happen to you. I'm asking you, I'm, I'm telling you, Scripture points us in the right direction in the midst of our trial that we would look to Jesus. We would look to God. We would depend on His Spirit living inside of us to carry us through, knowing that whom God has taken in His hand, none can shake loose. So let's, let's look at this passage real quick. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. I want to read a little passage to you. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, keep, look, look at the way that they're phrasing this. What can separate us from the love of Christ? And then he turns around and says, For your sake we're being killed. We're like sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now watch, this is the passage that I really want you to catch a hold of. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? So let's back up to 35. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Nope. Distress? Nope. Nope. Persecution? Mm -hmm. Famine? I've dealt with that a lot, haven't I? <laughs> Nakedness? Danger? The sword? If none of these, what are you facing that is beyond any of these? It doesn't fit into some of these, one of these categories. But, but he doesn't stop there. He goes even further. And he says, neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers. Now, you know what that rulers, he's speaking of there, right? Demons. Yeah, he's talking about demons. If you go back to Ephesians uh, chapter 6, where he's talking about putting on the full armor of God, he, t he lists uh, what I believe is he lists the order of the, the demon hierarchy in the demonic world, and, and he talks about rulers in high places. It's the same idea here. Okay? He's saying, um, angel, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present, what you're going through right now, nor things to come, the thing you're worried about right now, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. All creation. What, what is, the only uncreated thing is God. So everything else is created. So nothing in that can separate you from the love of God. Is that not something to take joy in? Amen. It's not based on our abilities. It's not based on, on what we're going through or not going through. God, if you just get me right through this, I'll have joy. No. We have joy in that 
because of who is taking us through it. Right? Okay, so, going back to what we talked about last week. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. How do we get fullness of joy? We get into the presence of God. Right? Well, how do you get into the presence of God? Well, there's, there's a number of things that you can do. Quite honestly, what gets you into the presence of God is probably radically different than what gets me into the presence of God. Okay? For me, it's quiet time. I, I start with worship music, and I, I sing some praise and worship music. <clears throat> I, I listen to some instrumental music, and then I shut all the music off, and I, I, I may say a very, very short prayer, because that's not my praying time. I, I have other times to pray. This is my time to just be quiet before God. Just to be in his presence. And, and I'll tell you, I am always in his presence, but I don't always feel like I'm in his presence. Okay? Don't be misled. Don't be distracted by what you feel. It's absolutely fantastic when you feel the presence of God. I relish those moments. I cherish those moments. But I'm not foolish enough to believe that if I don't feel the presence of God, that he's gone away. Because he promises me in his word that he will not leave me, nor will he forsake me. Nowhere can I go that he is not there. Whether I ascend to the heights, or whether I go down to the grave, whether I go to the uttermost parts of the sea, he is there. So I know when I'm out on the deck and I don't feel him, he is there. Okay? So for me, that's, that's my time. That's, man, I, I look forward to being in the presence of God, but I'm not deceived if I don't feel it. Okay? Now, I believe God has given us feelings for very purposeful reasons. I believe sin has come in and totally des destroyed our understanding of how they're supposed to work. I mean, really. If, if your favorite team loses and it ruins your day, uh, I'm speaking to myself, okay? John Elway made me break my TV. <laughs> it was his fault. I'm still trying to convince God of that. <laughs> but that, that really, actually, that's when I quit watching football. Okay? Because I realized if it had that much of a hold on me that I was going to act that foolishly and that stupidly, that I, I, I don't need it. I, I can, let, let's, just it. let's just put it to the side. Okay? Um, I, I also found that reading I love to read. Um, when I was in school, you know, 800 to 1,000 pages a day was normal. Okay, I kind of led to some problems with Christy because I didn't talk when I was reading. I was non-communicative when I read. And my children always learned that if you're talking to Dad when he reads, it doesn't count. <laughs> and if you want an answer from me, you have to touch me and make me look at you, make sure my eyes clear, and I give a coherent answer, not just the one you want. Because I got that, they pulled that on me a lot. Who said you could use my tools to build a fort? Why is my power saw out in the field? Well, Dad, you said I could use it. There's no power out there. Yeah, we found that out. That's why it's still out there. We're waiting for you to get power out there. Wait, who, when, when did this happen? When did this occur? Dad, you were sitting in your chair. We both came up and talked to you. Did I answer? You kind of mumbled. We took that to be yes. What did Mom say? She said to ask you. Family meeting. We need to lay new ground rules. But when I realized that my reading was coming in between me and God, he had me laid down. And it has been 
six months, seven months, and in that seven month period, I think I've actually read two books besides this. And every time I pick a book up, and I, I mean, I've got a stack of books that I just <coughs> want to read, and every time I pick it up and I start flipping through it, I just feel I'm prompting me. You're not ready yet. You're not ready yet. You're still too easily distracted. You need to, you need to lay that down. And, and some of these books are good books. They're not just, just titillating things that make my mind wander. But he wants me to stick here for now. Okay? Now, I, I don't know where, where you guys are with those things, but if we are going to be successful in this life, if we are going to be more than conquerors in this life, don't you think we need to know intimately the one that makes us more than conquerors? Mm -hmm. Don't you think we should do everything we can to be prepared for the battle that we're facing? Look, you know, we talk a lot about how you know, things get bad here in the States. <coughs> we, we have no clue what that is. You know, we, we really don't. And I can tell you why, because we're sitting here in public talking about this. And I mean, you look around you, how many people have these in their laps? Uh, there's, there's lots of countries where it's illegal to have one of these. And if you get caught with one of these, you go to jail and they beat on you as a gentle reminder of the laws of the land. Okay? And when you talk about these, when you gather together to talk about these, it's bad enough to have one of these. But if you gather together to talk about these, they take that as an assault against the state. And that's treason. We are so privileged to be here, and we are so stinking complacent, and we're so fat and lazy in our spiritual walks that we have no strength for the battle to come. No strength. And I can tell you this because I've heard you and I've heard myself whine and complain about the tribulations that we go through. Money's a little tight. I'm not going to get to go to the movies with you guys this week. Well, pray that God would deliver me. Oh, you know, I, I, I got a health issue. I got to go to the doctor and and get it taken care of. You know, they're going to put me on some medication. You've got insurance to go to the doctor. You've got a doctor to go to, and you've got medication to take, and that's a problem? Oh, I, I really don't think I should say anything. I'm just going to pray for him. I'm going to let the testimony of my life be my witness. And, and, and you know, I don't want to offend them. You're going to not offend them right into hell. Really? That's, that's our goal? I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching to us. Okay? Because I'm in the same boat that you are. Friday night, the youth group went out to First Friday, and we, we went up and down the streets to witness to people. And, and there was not a lot of witnessing done, mostly because there were not a lot of people. And it was cold, and, and people didn't want to stand around and talk. I struggle with doing those things. Uh, for the most part, I don't feel people really have any interest in what I got to say to begin with. But then when I'm going out to meet somebody that I don't know, and I'm supposed to tell them about, you know, I'm thinking, God, you got a lot better people at this than me. Yeah, but I called you. Can we discuss this? Uh, Benjamin, you gave Benjamin, Benjamin. We'll, we'll, we'll get Benjamin. I'll go with Benjamin. Because he's good at this. He had to work. <laughs> God and I had some words about that. He won. And then, and then on top of it, as we're getting ready to go out, Christy and I have a spat. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, because as soon as we had the spat, we immediately started getting our focus back, and we understood it was an attack of the enemy trying to get us up our game so that we couldn't do what we were supposed to do. We got right back up on our feet. A wise man stumbles seven times, sometimes in a minute, and always gets back to his feet. Okay? Don't, don't mess up about messing up. 
get back to your feet and get on. And so we went out and, and we didn't get a lot of talking done. Like I said, there weren't a lot of people out there. I, I was, we were kind of prompted to be very careful out there by a man who I think had imbibed a little too freely as he was digging through the ashtray looking for cigarette butts, I guess. And, and so that was kind of encouraging. We got to speak to a couple of people. We actually got to speak with some people from another church. That was very encouraging. Um, but, but I went. I went. Um, a couple weeks ago, we were at the grocery store, and, and we were standing there, and I don't even know what we were. I, I know what I was looking at. I was looking at all the stuff thinking, why can't she pick one? <laughs> and Christy was looking at all the stuff trying to figure out which one she needed. And there was a young lady standing down there that worked at the store. And I felt like God prompted me to, to speak to her. We went to the next aisle, and we needed to come back to that aisle, and I felt like God prompted me again. You need to speak to her. I want you to say this to her, a very specific word to her. <laughs> I refused again, and we went. We got all the way to the other end of the store, and Christy said, Oh, I forgot something. Now, the, the way we shop, that's normal. <laughs> And that gives me something to do because then I can walk back and get whatever it was. Well, guess where I had to go to get what we needed. And I'm standing there looking for, I don't even remember what it was. I'm standing there looking at she's standing down there. And I'm not even seeing what I'm looking at. I'm arguing with God. I'm, God, she's going to look at me like I'm a fool. She's, she's probably going to pepper spray me. <laughs> <laughs> she probably has one of those extendable baton thingies. <laughs> And then the police will come. <laughs> Can't I just grab the green beans and go? <laughs> I want you to tell her this. Fine, 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 fine. <laughs> and so I walked over and I told her. And she looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> <laughs> she did not pull out the pepper spray or the extendable baton she did not call the police I told her what I felt like God wanted me to tell her and I walked very briskly away God wants me to tell you this have a great day <laughs> you laughed but you weren't there <laughs> All the things that I was worried about happening didn't happen. And I'll tell you, I don't know if she received what God had me speak to her. Uh, that's not my, that's not really my concern. Okay? It's not your responsibility for how they respond. It's your responsibility to deliver the message. Just like in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are ambassadors of the message of reconciliation. That's our job. That's what we've been given to do. To put the word out there telling them what we've received, what we've already been given. So much for peace. We're not getting to peace today. <laughs> Which you know what that means. You know what my next Sunday morning is going to be like. <laughs> so you guys get to pray all week long for my peace next Sunday morning. Okay? I'm not sure I want you to pray that. <laughs> because then he's going to put me in situations where I have to Trust him for peace. Just pray for me. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. Amen? Amen? Joy. Joy comes from knowing who he is. Knowing that he's right there with you, taking you through anything and everything that you will face. That he trusts you enough to allow you to go through that. Can you imagine that? That God has enough confidence in you to allow you to go through the hard things you have to go through? Wow. Because some of you guys have gone through some horrendously difficult things. And I, I marvel to see what God has done in your lives to bring you out of those things. And I'm amazed at how awesome he is. Take joy. 
Okay, do I end the hardship and the trials and the tribulation? Know that nothing is going to pull you away from the love that he has for you. That he is right there with you and he is pouring out love into you. He is pouring out strength into you. He is pouring out everything you need in that moment. Cry out to him. David says, from the depths I call to you and you saved me. From whatever pit you're stuck in, cry out to him and he will save you. He's told us that in his word. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, that the joy that you exhibit in my life does not depend on my ability to have it. But, Father, it just depends completely on you. Help me, Father, to live in that joy. Because, Father, you've given me so much to take joy in. Help me, Father, to live that. That, Father, this fruit would just be abundant in my life. Father, for my brothers and sisters here today, I ask the same. That, God, you would help us to get our focus where it needs to be, that it would be right on you. <clears throat> Despite what's going on around us, sometimes the chaos and the turmoil that is going on around us, Father, that our focus would be on you, and that in that moment we would have joy because we know whose we are. Give us strength, Father. Teach us. Instruct us. Draw us. Woo us. Help us to know the passion with which you pursue us. I bless you today, Father, and we thank you. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus, amen. amen.